Hello, welcome to today's class. We have uh, two master gardeners, Kelly and Shilpa, talking about companion planning and IPM. So without further ado, Kelly and Shilpa, welcome. Thank you so much, Ken. Hello, welcome to Companion Planting and Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. My name is Shilpa, and I'm here with my co-presenter, Kelly. And we're gonna start out by introducing ourselves. So Kelly is a UC Master Gardener and San Mateo County Master Composter. She enjoys learning, using, and sharing sustainable garden principles. And she is a member of the UC Master Gardener's Soil Specialists Group and is particularly interested in soil, growing food, and composting. And Shilpa is a San Carlos-based UC Master Gardener. She enjoys growing herbs, fruit trees, and vegetables to use for cooking and baking. She grows new and uncommon varieties from seed whenever possible, and is always excited to share experiences and plants with both new and expert gardeners. So as uh, UCCE Master Gardener volunteers, we are trained and certified by the University of California to provide research-based information on home horticulture and pest management. Our goal is to help home gardeners and community organizations garden sustainably and create a healthy environment. So for today's class, as we said, we're gonna be covering companion planting and integrated pest management or IPM. And we're going to start by giving an overview of each of these methodologies, and then we'll talk about the relationship between various aspects of them and how they overlap. Um, and then we'll go through some of the strategies of com companion planting uh, more specifically. And then finally, we'll close with some examples from the home garden. Just a note uh, that since this is a recorded presentation, we will not be doing a Q&A session. So we're starting out with the definition of companion planting that we're using today, which is the close pairing of two or more plant species in order to improve the overall ecosystem of the garden. There are many benefits of companion planting, which include pest control, which directly relates to IPM, st uh, soil stewardship or fostering healthy soil, and physical support and aesthetics. With companion planting, you'll be improving the functionality and look of your garden, and this is what we'll spend a lot of time talking about today. We'll be taking a whole ecosystem view and touching on further benefits, such as biodiversity, improved pollination, and the creation of habitat. Also, water conservation and reduced water runoff, whether that be from irrigation or precipitation. We may think of all of these things as separate efforts to protect our ecology and our soil, but they're closely related to one another and to how we manage our gardens. Uh, at a more systemic level, we're talking about a shift in our view of gardening to consider the whole ecosystem versus just what's in it for us as humans. Um, the nice thing though, is that this shift really is to our benefit anyway. You may hear some terms that are closely related to what we're calling companion planting that we'll use today, uh, such as intercropping, interplanting, polyculture, plant partners, and plant associations. So we just mentioned that we're focused on the ecosystem as a whole, and this is in contrast to what's traditionally thought of as companion planting, which was often based on folklore, anecdotes, and traditions that somehow we could pair plants to improve flavor or yield. Uh, some of these assertions may have worked, but often they may have been lacking a bit when it came to scientific testing and evidence. Today, with modern companion planting, we're much better equipped to study how and why plants interact with one another as well as their surroundings. We have advanced to highly sensitive in, uh, instruments to measure things that we can't even see. And we have a much deeper scientific understanding of how horticultural and many other related processes work. Um, keep in mind, this is a field of active study, and we're constantly learning new things. Um, scientists continue the advancement of knowledge in all areas, of course. So that's uh, just a really short overview of companion planting. We'll go into more later, but now Shilpa will do an overview of integrated pest management. 
Great. So what is integrated pest management? So IPM is an eco ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage. And in IPM, we use a combination of methods or controls to manage pests. And the idea is that um, we're basing this on studies that have shown that the most effective long-term way to manage pests is by using a combination of these methods in concert um, rather than separately. So they support each other as you're trying to control your pests. So these controls are typically grouped into four categories and they are biological controls, cultural controls, mechanical, physical controls, and chemical controls. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna first define what each of these control types is. And then Kelly will explain how they fit into a process you can use to solve pest problems in your own gardens. So with that, Let's start with the first one, biological control. And this is the use of natural enemies, predators, parasitoids, pathogens, and competitors to control pests and their damage. And in order to practice biological control, what we need to do is to identify and encourage the natural enemies of our pests. Um, and all pests, by the way, do have natural enemies. So whether they are insects, weeds, plant diseases, rodents, you name it, everything's got uh, something else that's going to um, eat it, basically. <laughs> um, so we want to pre preserve and encourage these naturally occurring beneficials, and that's usually more effective than importing them and um, trying to uh, just sort of place them in our environment and expect them to stay there. And so what we, what's the more effective thing is to actually provide what they need, which is year-round food, water, and shelter. And the other thing is that many, um, many insects undergo a pretty um, significant metamorphosis in their life cycle. And so this is what, um, this is what I wanna point out in this picture on the right-hand side of this slide. So this is showing the picture at the top, the image at the top is the brown lacewing adult form. Now, if you didn't um, look this up, you might not realize that if you see this larval form on your plants, that it's, it's the same species. Um, and then moreover, if you saw these eggs or notice these pupae on your plants, again, you wouldn't necessarily know that these are the same species. So um, this is where it's really important to kind of understand what the different, different life, life stages of a beneficial insect are. And in some cases they do rely on different food sources and you'd wanna provide um, food sources for multiple life stages. The next control is cultural control. And these are practices that reduce pest establishment, reproduction, dispersal, and survival. And here in this type of control, you're usually making changes to the environment that affect availability of suitable conditions for the plant. Um, you know, most likely nutrients and water, but lots of things. Um, and so a really easy example is that suppose um, you're trying to do a cultural control by changing your irrigation in order to minimize pests and support beneficials. And so an example of this would be that you uh, adjust your irrigation program uh, so as to water plants during the early morning hours. And this allows time for water to infil uh, for water infiltration into the soil before the day gets warm. And then this, because we've got the maximum amount of time before nightfall to dry for the for any wet foliage and roots to dry, um, we can prevent those wet roots and foliage overnight, which in turn, if those plant parts, if those plant parts stay damp overnight, that can really promote uh, fungal disease. So that's a way to change a cultural practice to, um, to prevent a pest. Um, other cultural practices include things like digging, crop rotation, um, shifting planting dates, pruning of specific types to, um, to deter pests. Um, and then just a note here that you're going to notice as we go through all these things that there can be a lot of overlap between various control, various IPM controls, right? So some of these things, it can get a little confusing. Oh, is that a cultural control or a biological control? For example, suppose you're putting in plants to encourage beneficial insects. 
um, you've just you've just implemented a cultural control that will um, hopefully give support to a biological control. So there's there's crossover and that's normal. All right, our next one is the mechanical and physical control category. In this in this type of control, you are killing a pest directly, blocking pests out, or making the environment unsuitable for a pest. Um, so this is all the manual stuff you'll do. Uh, examples might be if you throw a, a mesh or a net over um, over a plant, let's say a blueberry plant or something, to prevent bird damage or insect um, predation of those or insect uh, attack on those um, on those crops. Another example is if you plant a hedgerow as a barrier to physically impede pest movement from one area of your garden to another. Um, you might be planting a ground cover to shade soil dwelling beneficial insects. Here on this slide, um, we've got uh, a fellow master gardener, John Andrews, who is uh, employing a mechanical control um, for squirrels. Um, and here's another example from John's garden where um, there are these hydrangeas, right, in bloom. And he'd put up this barrier that was, um, these are really just opened up tomato cages uh, with these, these really large holes of mesh. And I thought, I, when I saw this, I thought this can't, what can this be for? And he said, oh, it's for deer. And I was like, well, it can't possibly keep them out. And um, I learned from him that, that in fact, it isn't about a barrier. It's more just that these are wobbly um, structures that will frighten the deer. So if a deer walks up, um, they'll shake around a little bit and therefore frighten the deer off. And so sometimes you can get really creative with these physical controls. Um, other things include hardware cloth to prevent raccoons rolling up bits of your lawn. Uh, we've got a picture of that further down. Um, and anytime you're hand picking slugs or hand pulling your weeds or trapping um, uh, pests, these are all mechanical physical controls. And last and most definitely least is chemical, chemical control. And this is the use of pesticides. And the term pesticides we're using very broadly to include insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, and more. All of these are considered pesticides. So unsurprisingly, this is considered a last resort and meant to be used in combination with other approaches for more effective long-term control. So what that means is you've already tried the other category, control categories, and you'll keep doing those things. And uh, the chemical control may serve as a boost to those basic things that you're doing. So don't stop doing those other control methods. Um, next, the important thing is to select the most targeted pesticides you can for your pest problem. You wanna avoid anything that's labeled as a broad spectrum product. Um, and the reason for this is that most likely a broad spectrum product is not only going to target your pest, but also many other species in the garden. And of particular concern is if it's going to target some of your existing beneficial insects. Additionally, if you're applying a pesticide sooner or later, it's likely to end up in your soil and that might affect the health of your soil negatively. Next, it's important to apply and dispose of your pesticides according to instructions and in a way that minimizes their possible harm to people, non-target organisms, and to the environment. And keep in mind that these chemical agents are actually tested and approved with these instructions in mind. So the assumption is that you are going to, they are going to be used according to the guidelines. And that is the the limited um, operating range for safety with a lot of these chemicals. And along the same lines, remember that using more of these chemical agents is not necessarily better. Um, in fact, most of the time it's not. Um, in most cases, um, you know, uh, you're, you're gonna be wasting the product and your investment uh, in that product and then worst case is that you're going to be harming, you're going to be compounding the harm to the environment and to the organisms that you're trying, that you're not trying to affect, right? So, um, and in some cases, the pesticide doesn't even, it might actually work less well if you apply more. So definitely follow the guidelines for um, the application rates that are recommended, and all of them will have that on the label. 
Um, so an example of a, of a chemical control that I do actually um, use pretty consistently to keep ants out of my own home <laughs> are ant baits. And this is a really good example of a targeted um, pesticide. Um, bait stations are really, affected, really effective at targeting ants specifically without affecting any other um, species as compared to, you can also buy ant sprays, but we don't, you know, we, uh, that's a less targeted type of control of chemical control because it could affect many other things and will, and may um, persist in the environment as well. So now Kelly will describe how these IPM, IPM control techniques fit into an overall IPM process. Okay, so the control methods that Shilpa just reviewed are used to create an ecosystem-based strategy called an IPM program that focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage. And while each garden situation is different, of course, um, six major components are common to all IPM programs. So first is identification, where you accurately identify the problem and associated pest. Uh, this is very important so that you know what you're dealing with and can target the right organism. Uh, there are lots of resources that can help with identification. The UCIPM website has a plant problem diagnostic tool um, that you can use to ID problems yourself. Um, you enter as much information as possible, including plant type, plant name, plant parts that are affected, and the type of damage you see. And then it returns you know, suspected culprits that then you can go and investigate further. The Master Gardener Helpline can help you identify and diagnose problems. And at the end of the slide set, we'll have information uh, about how to submit requests for help or the hours and locations that you can actually visit in person. Um, there are also other resources that you can contact for help, and many of them are provided by local and regional governments, uh, such as the San Mateo County Department of Agriculture Weights and Measures. Um, they actually have biologists on staff to help uh, with pest identification and problems. Um, the second step is monitoring and assessing pest numbers and damage. Um, if you're finding few pests and acceptable levels of damage, you may be able to just let it go. Um, frequently, predators will follow pests and the problem will resolve itself. If, however, you deem the problem unacceptable and management action is needed, then the third step is researching the guidelines to address the problem. The fourth step of taking preventative measures using non-chemical controls may adequately control the issue. Um, because we're talking about trying to prevent problems, this may be something that happens longer term over more than one cycle or season. Uh, for example, if you have an annual pest or a season, uh, I'm sorry, an annual plant <laughs> or a seasonal pest, you may think about what you can do for the next crop or season. The fifth step um, is an active stage of using a combination of biological, cultural, mechanical, physical, and chemical management tools, starting with the least toxic method, since least toxic methods will be safer for you, your family, and the environment. And um, just to note here, steps four and five are where companion planting may really be helpful. So the sixth step is after action has been taken, where you assess the effect of the control method or methods you've used to determine whether the measures you've taken are successful, or if you need to reevaluate and take further action. You would go through kind of the iteration of steps five and six until you're at an acceptable level of control. And um, just a little note that at each step, it can be helpful to take notes for reference. And now we'll see how to put an IPM program into practice. So here's an example of uh, IPM process. Now um, you'll see that it doesn't always follow such a neatly laid out uh, steps, step by step process, but that um, but that that got, that series of steps can be a guideline for when you encounter real life issues. Okay, so this. This was a thing that happened with my neighbor um, just a few weeks ago, in fact. 
And what happened is that uh, my neighbor uh, first noticed these circular, remarkably um, regular circular holes in her rose leaves and birch trees. And the first assumption was that they might be cat caterpillars, you know, and keep in mind, they just installed these plants. They have a brand new backyard that they invested in and they want it to look nice. So it's understandable that they were immediately concerned and thought uh, to try to solve this, this problem. So the first assumption is perhaps that, 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 that perhaps they're caterpillars. Um, they looked around for them, but didn't see anything and assumed that they would need to spray something. And at this point, uh, my neighbor happened to run into me and um, asked me about it. And um, I'd never seen this before, but after a bit of online searching, uh, it was revealed that this kind of damage is caused by the leaf cutter bee. And um, that their nests are often found at the base of rose shrubs. And so this corresponds to the first step that Kelly described in the previous slide in that we have identified our pest. And um, at this point, the homeowner's first reaction and question was, well, how do I eradicate them? And I love this because this is where most of us start, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with asking that question. And it is a completely human and understandable thing to be thinking that we, you know, this isn't what we were expecting. We wanted nice rose bushes and birch trees. Um, here's a problem. How do we get rid of it? And the point of following the IPM process is to keep your curiosity going. So look a little further. Um, in particular, what is the pest doing and why? Um, how, how, of, how else besides the damage that the pest is doing uh, does this species affect the environment? Uh, is it doing good things and, and bad things? And even those terms, good and bad, are all a, a matter of perspective, right? Um, another thing to consider is, uh, is this damage ongoing? Will things come to some kind of equilibrium? Um, how much damage to the plant can I tolerate? Um, you know, it, what is the consequence of both tolerating the harm and not tolerating the harm? So these are all questions we can start asking at this point. Um, and so we did some more reading about the role of leafcutter bees in the ecosystem, what some of the natural enemies might be, um, and the risk of on ongoing damage. So this corresponds to step three, research. Um, and one of the things we learned is that these bees are, um, well, we learned that these bees are a native pollinator species. Many native bees, I'm not sure about leafcutter bees, but many native bees are endangered in fact, um, and that they have many natural predators to keep their populations in check. Now, when I mentioned this to my neighbor, she said, but they've been there for months. And now I point this out because that co corresponds to step two, which we didn't talk about yet, the monitoring step. So ideally, when you have a pest problem in your garden, you're gonna to wanna to do some monitoring. Um, here there was, it's very easy to make an assumption. You see these holes in your leaves and you think, well, I've been seeing that for months. So they, that means the pest is there for months, but you don't actually know that because once the holy leaves are there um, until they fall off, uh, they're still there. So we don't know if the number of leaves being attacked is increasing or staying the same, or um, and we haven't actually seen our pest firsthand. So that's the whole monitoring aspect of it. We also learned that pesticides don't work well on them. And um, another thing to consider is, the, is just the plants themselves. So silver birches and most roses are deciduous, meaning they're going to drop their leaves within a few weeks at this point and uh, put out new growth in the spring. And so this holy leaf damage is, um, is, soon, to be, is soon to be not even visible at all. Um, so all this stuff together um, kind of gives rise to a new perspective. And uh, I believe at some point my neighbor watched a video on leafcutter bees with her son and texted me back, texted me back to say, oh, they're so cute. How sweet that they use the little leaf pieces to line their nests. And um, we have this lovely picture on the right of a leaf cutter bee actually carrying a leaf segment back to her nest. Amazing photo by a very patient woman in Australia. Um, and so that's where we ended up with this example. Um, we decided, you know, oh, okay, it's fine. We don't really need to do anything further. These plants are large enough that they're not going to sustain any lasting damage from this pest. Um, 
Now, what that leaves is IPM steps four, five, and six, preventing, managing, and assessing, right? And in some cases, of course, those steps are absolutely necessary. Um, so in this case, a way to, you know, if we had decided that perhaps maybe we were seeing damage on a very young plant um, that didn't have a lot of uh, foliage to begin with and was in danger of being killed, um, you, could do, you could do something minimally invasive, like tent the plant with some fine mesh to exclude the bees, and then you could monitor um, that would be, so those would be the prevent, that would probably be a prevention strategy. Um, and then you could do step six assessment to see how well that was working. Um, it's assessment can be very similar to step two monitoring. You're basically, uh, trying to see, do you, you know, are your pests being excluded? Are you seeing continuing damage, et cetera? You could take photos every week, count the number of damaged leaves, um, lots of ways to, to assess whether your control technique is working. Great, thanks Shilpa for that very um, very great example and such great timing too. <laughs> so um, now that we've reviewed what companion planting and IPM are, we just wanted to highlight uh, the relationships and commonalities uh, with these strategies. So first both, you know, really focus on sustainability, doing less harm and the whole ecosystem. Um, companion planting, though, often involves planning where decisions about what plant partnerships you'll use are made kind of at the outset, even before you put plants in. So often it is proactive. Um, on the other hand, IPM usually addresses problems as they arise, so it's a little more reactive. But regardless of timing, um, whether you're planning a new garden or you're observing what's going on with the plants that are already there, companion planting and IPM can be closely related and recursive. Uh, many of the benefits of companion planting are achieved using IPM control methods, and some of those IPM control methods actually involve companion planting. Oops. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, okay. So with that said, um, let's go through companion planting and, um, and some of its benefits and then the way they relate, the way they interrelate with IPM controls. And so for companion planting, we can categorize benefits as improving, the first one being improving biological control. And unsurprisingly, this corresponds to IPM biological controls. Um, another benefit is to reduce, to reduce insect pest pressure. This corresponds to IPM cultural and mechanical physical controls. We can use companion planting to reduce weed pressure corresponding to IPM cultural and mechanical physical controls. Uh, we can improve soil fertility and structure. This corresponds to IPM cultural controls. We can reduce disease pressure corresponding to cultural and mechanical physical controls. We can provide support and structure corresponding to uh, IPM cultural and mechanical physical controls. And then in addition with companion planting, there are a few benefits that uh, don't directly um, correspond to any kind of IPM um, control technique. And those are to, of course, improve aesthetics because that's important to most of us. And also to improve pollination, which is extremely important for most of our gardening endeavors. And as we go through these, so you'll notice right away here that um, we've highlighted each benefit in blue. And these are the whys of companion planting. You can think of them as, you know, if you're asking the question, why use companion planting? Well, these are these are the reasons why you would. Um, but but more, um, more importantly, what we want you to uh, be able to take away is how each of these benefits uh, are incurred. So what's the mechanism by which these uh, benefits are um, are happening. And the reason for that is that while we're going to give a bunch of specific examples in the following slides, um, the chances that your particular pest problem in your own garden is going to map onto these specific 
cases is, you know, not high because there are, there's such a wide variety of pest problems that you can have. And so we're hoping that with this information, you'll be armed with enough understanding that you'll be able to come up with your own companion planting solutions in your own garden. So first step is biological control. So how do companion plants improve biological control? Um, much like what we talked about in the IPM section, they are supporting and encouraging beneficial insects. Um, again, those are the par par predators and parasitoids. And um, they, uh, it, as we said, it's more beneficial. Well, there's an example actually from real life. Um, most of us have heard of the idea of buying ladybugs and releasing them in our gardens to control an aphid infestation, right? And those of you who have tried this have probably noticed that what happens more often than not is that the ladybugs don't stay. And so maybe they help a little, maybe they help more than a little, but sooner or later they're gone. Why is it that they're gone? And this is where the attracting rather than releasing of your beneficial insect is important. So the idea is that if you provide nutrition uh, and habitat and year round food in the form of diverse plants that are blooming at uh, a variety of times during the course of the season, um, you're going to more than just uh, inviting, uh, inviting them to your garden, you're going to give them a reason to set up, set up house and stay in your garden. So who are these garden good guys that we keep talking about? Um, well, they're usually grouped into three categories, and they are predators, parasitoids, and pathogens. And um, I'll give an example for each of these categories. So we've already talked about the lady, the lady beetle or ladybug in the left photo. Um, here, this one is shown feeding on an aphid. Um, and predators are typically those beneficial insects that hunt down and kill. Uh, one individual is going to hunt down and kill numerous individual pests. Um, they are usually usually larger and stronger than their prey. And in some predators, this is true of the ladybug, both the adult and the immature stage um, are going to be predaceous. And so that's really to an advantage, to our, to our advantage. The next category are parasitoids. Um, these, uh, rather than attacking multiple hosts or multiple, sorry, multiple pest insects, they only attack one host in their lifetime and they, um, and typically they are infecting the host and laying eggs in that host and thus producing many, many more offspring of that beneficial parasitoid. Um, so this middle photo here shows an example. Um, this is a parasitic wasp, which is laying its eggs in a walnut aphid. And these eggs will then hatch and the larva will consume the insides of the aphid. So this is really some horror show stuff, um, but hey, nature can be quite brutal <laughs> and it's good when nature's on our side with this stuff. Um, and just a quick note on the difference between parasites and parasitoids. Um, they are related terms, but different in several diff several ways. Um, most importantly, parasites typically don't kill their hosts, whereas parasitoids always do. And then finally, we have pathogens. Um, and these are beneficial microorganisms, including some bacteria, fungi, nematodes, protozoa, and viruses that can infect and kill pests. Um, this right-hand photo is showing some caterpillars, and they are infected with a naturally occurring fungus. Um, which is probably present as a result of spraying an aerated compost tea solution. Um, so kind of like a probiotic for your garden. So all of these examples are, all of these are examples of biological controls in IPM. And um, UP, UC, the UC ANR IPM website, which Kelly mentioned, is really a great resource for learning about these natural enemies, both in general, just to um, just to understand who some of your your beneficials are, but especially if you have a especially if you have a specific pest issue that you're working on. So the next benefit of companion planting is how to reduce pest pressure. And in IPM, these are generally cultural and mechanical physical controls. 
Uh, before we talk about how to do this, though, it's helpful to understand how pests find plants. Pests are attracted to a host plant, uh, mostly by a combination of visual cues like appearance, color, and size, chemical cues, uh, which are like volatile chemicals similar to odors and aromas, and tactile cues, which are like feeling or actually tasting the right plant. Uh, we can use companion planting techniques to manipulate the habitat and reduce pest pressure by doing things like physically impeding pest movement. Um, like Shilpa mentioned, you can create hedgerows, which is like growing a wall that inhibits, you know, movements of pests from one area to another, or plant ground cover to impede the movement of pests that dwell, lay eggs, or pupate in the ground. Um, three more ways, which we'll go into more detail in the following slides, um, are luring pests away or trap cropping, masking or hiding crops to disrupt feeding, and interfering with egg laying. So first, um, trap cropping is using sacrificial companions to draw pests away from your host plants. Um, the idea is to pick a plant that's more attractive to pests than your desired crop. Um, an age-old technique in commercial agriculture shields pests from crops by attracting them to a small area and then annihilating the pests with target pesticides, you know, thus not having to spray the edible crops. Um, for home gardeners, the mere presence of a correct trap crop nearby is often enough to diminish pest damage to a tolerable level without having to use pesticides, or you just might consider using like a vacuum to remove the pest without applying any pesticides. Um, there are a number of considerations for uh, trap cropping, including when, how many, and then where to plant your trap crops. Um, as for when to plant, especially for veggies, you usually want to give the trap crop a few weeks head start so that they can lure pests while your host crop is getting established. A very general guideline for how many trap crop plants to plant is between 10 to 20% of the area of your host crop. And the location or distance away depends on how mobile the pest is. You know, plant them further away for mobile pests and then closer for less mobile pests. Um, two examples of companion plants that help reduce pest damage by trap cropping are uh, planting radish to attract flea beetles away from tomatoes or eggplants, and mustard greens to lure harlequin bugs away from primarily coal crops, but also many other veggies. Um, another way to reduce pest pressure is masking, which blocks a pest detection of volatile chemical cues released by a host plant. Um, there's a widely known hypothesis called the resource concentration hypothesis, and it proposes that plant eating insects are less likely to find and remain on their host plant in diverse habitats. Um, in field studies where interplanting or companion planting is employed, um, insects spend less time on the vegetable crops that are growing there. So this kind of polyculture approach also increases the number of pest eating beneficial insects, resulting in lower pest populations and less damage to the host crops. Um, a few examples of um, companion plants aimed at protecting host plants through masking are nasturtiums among zucchini to deter squash bugs, uh, basil to mask tomatoes from thrips, and calendula to mask collards, and other coal crops from aphids. Um, the last way companion planting can reduce pest damage via habitat manipulation is by interfering with egg laying. And there is some fascinating research emerging that pests may actually locate host plants, not just through visual and chemical cues, but also by making a series of landings on a plant's leaves and like tasting it with receptors on their feet. Uh, researchers have observed that the pests need to make a specific number of appropriate landings on the leaves of their target plant before they receive enough stimuli to initiate egg laying behavior. So if a host plant is 
uh, interplanted with a companion plant, the pests end up making an occasional landing on that non-target plant, throwing off the required number of appropriate landings, and then making it less likely that the pest will settle down and lay eggs. So if you know proven true through more research study, this theory could have a significant impact on agriculture in general. And although more research is needed, um, this method, you know, can work in our favor, in, in our favor. So uh, here we have a few examples of companion plantings that have shown to limit egg laying behaviors of certain pests. One is using sage, dill, or chamomile with coal crops to deter cabbage worm butterflies. Another is planting white clover around cabbage plants to suppress uh, cabbage root maggot fly. And a third is planting cilantro with cabbage to manage aphids. The next companion planting benefit is to suppress weeds. Um, so in IPM, this mechanism is a cultural control. And two ways that this works. First is a living mulch, and um, in IPM, that's actually a mechanical physical control. Um, so in this, so there's sometimes this crossover between the different IPM techniques, um, and this kind of falls into, into both of those categories. Um, and so a living mulch uh, is a bit like wood chips, except it's going to grow. And so what that means is that you're going to need to mow or cut or cut it down periodically. Um, and you do, the one thing you need to guard against is that it, um, you don't want it taking over the main crop. Um, so an example of this would be tomato plants. Um, and in order to cover the soil that's in between the tomato plants, you can, uh, in, you can plant in between uh, some white clover and that should help uh, reduce any weed, reduce some of that weed pressure that you would normally see. The second mechanism for using companion plants to suppress weeds is allelopathy. Now this is um, a more involved way of thinking about the way plants interact with the soil and their surroundings. Um, and one of the things that we might not expect, but is in fact the case, is that they release substances from their roots and leaves, which end up in the surrounding soil. And so this is what's meant by allelopathy. And that's what's shown in this diagram over here on the left, um, all of the various plant parts in this diagram releasing uh, allele chemicals into, into the soil and into, the, in, into their uh, leaves and into the environment. Um, and some of these substances, we may not have heard the term allele chemicals, but actually that it corresponds to some term, some some very common chemicals that we are very familiar with. For example, caffeine and tannins. Um, quinine is also an LLO chemical. Um, quinine is uh, the reason that gin and tonics exists, uh, exist, as it turns out. Um, and so what these agents do, once the plant releases them into the soil, uh, they can do things like reduce germination rates, inhibit growth of surrounding plants, uh, sometimes even kill other plants. Um, and so for us in the home garden, in order to benefit from allelopathy and plant combinations, uh, it's certainly necessary for us to understand exactly how this is going to work specifically for those plants, right? So um, we need to know what's going on before we can, we can actually use the combinations effectively. And an example might be, suppose you have some tall transplanted crops um, as opposed to direct sown, right? So Suppose you buy or grow some tomato seedlings or kale seedlings and then transplant them into your garden beds. And, um, and then um, surrounding them, you would have some cucumbers planted and cucumbers are known to, to release some allelopathic chemicals, some allelochemicals, and um, can help through that, um, through that mechanism to suppress weed growth. Okay, um, the next benefit of companion planting is that uh, they can improve soil fertility when used as a cover crop or planted alongside crops, uh, alongside crops to um, aid in nutrient transfer. And companion plants can also help improve soil structure. So this all relates to IPM cultural controls. Uh, cover crops are used to feed the soil versus feeding us by providing a crop that we harvest. Um, a cover crop is generally grown in the season before your main crop. 
and is terminated or cut down before seeds form. Uh, that terminated cover crop is left in place to decompose and provide nutrients back to the soil, um, hence the phrase chop and drop. Um, some of the many benefits of cover crops include reducing erosion, creating habitat for beneficials, drawing nutrients that lie deep in the soil closer to the surface where other plant roots can access them, uh, adding organic matter, increasing biodiversity, and suppressing weeds. Um, a common question that people ask is, can I eat the fava beans from my cover crop? And while the answer is yes, <laughs> um, you can, <laughs> this actually defeats one of the goals of planting a cover crop. So in order to feed the soil most effectively, you really want nutrients to be more concentrated in the root system of the plant when it's half in flower before seeds form. Um, if you let your fava cover crop go to seed, the nutrients have moved um, into the beans. And when you harvest those beans, you're removing the nutrients rather than returning them to the soil. So an example of cover cropping um, is that during the winter, you can grow a cover crop of winter rye, mow it down before the seeds head form, um, you know, just leaving that cover crop on the soil. And after a few weeks, you can just plant, um, you know, right down in there, your summer vegetables. Uh, you can also use companion planting to improve nutrient transfer. So here you plant like a cover crop or plant companions alongside your main crops to aid in nutrient transfer. And this is sometimes referred to as living mulch since they'll also shade and protect the soil. For this strategy, you want to pair um, heavy feeders, which include a lot of our vegetable crops, uh, with nitrogen fixing plants. So a specific example for potatoes, say, is to intermingle bean plants uh, to help fix more nitrogen. Um, companion plants can also help improve soil structure. And the graphic here uh, shows healthy soil with good soil structure. Um, there's a lot going on here, but it shows you know, good aggregation of soil minerals, organic matter, and the soil life with lots of empty space for nutrient retention, water infiltration, movement and storage, and gas exchange. Um, there is a lot going on in the soil under our feet. And um, to keep soil healthy, it's really helpful to keep living roots in the ground. Um, different plants and cover crops provide different benefits. Dense fibrous roots produce lots of exudates that feed soil microbes. And if you have problems with compaction or you just want to try to open up your soil a bit, um, long tap roots can act as like a living rototiller. And a great example of this is tillage radishes, um, which are actually daikon but varieties that are bred for length rather than flavor. And the variety names here are kind of fun and evocative, like Groundhog, Sodbuster, and Driller. And um, Shilpa has been actually experimenting with these in her raspberry patch to help improve water infiltration and to make the crop more heat and drought resistance um, with some promising results. <laughs> I have indeed, and uh, we'll see how it goes, but been experimenting with that for the last year or so, and um, it seems like it's helping. Okay, so our next companion plant uh, benefit is that they can help reduce disease. And when we are talking about disease, so we're, we're basic, basically talking plant pathogens either below the ground in the soil or uh, diseases that are transmitted via spores or insects above ground. And many of these things that we're gonna be talking about uh, correspond to IPM cultural controls, except for a couple that I'll point, and I'll point those out when we get to them. Um, and this is a good point uh, to mention. Um, we've, met, we've mentioned cover crop and living mulch a few times, and you may be wondering whether these terms are interchangeable. In fact, many of these things are the same plants and the difference lies in the way that they're used. So when we say cover crop, generally what that means is that it's a crop that's planted before the main crop and then terminated 
and um, and allowed to the residue you either compost it or allowed to lay there and uh, you plant your main crop um, on top of that. A living mulch, um, while it may be the same actual species of plant, you're planting it alongside the main crop. Um, and as a result, um, it's, uh, it's, it may be something that uh, it just is growing next to it. Um, and it might provide many of the benefits of a non-living mulch while you're doing it. So this is often the case in perennial, let's say orchard culture or my berry patch, for example, where um, you have uh, living mulch that's planted in, um, in the middles of the rows for, you know, in a commercial operation. Um, and many of these plants that you would use as a cover crop or living mulch can provide more than one benefit as well. Um, and both of these can help in disease control. So they do this by supporting beneficial microorganisms. Um, this example is really striking. I didn't realize this was possible. So many of you may have heard, especially if you grow tomatoes or potatoes, that um, you should rotate your crops to prevent the buildup of, vert of the verticillium wilt uh, fungus. It's a disease that persists in your soil um, and that you should crop rotate so as to minimize the buildup of that pathogen. Um, and yes, you should uh, rotate your crops. Um, and in addition, um, what also helps is to plant oats as a cover crop, um, mow the oats down, and then wait a few weeks and plant potatoes in that crop residue. And that has been shown to decrease the presence of vertic verticillium wilt fungus in your soil. Um, some cover crops can uh, generate fungicidal compounds in your soil. Uh, an example of this are mustard greens. Um, and then as do most um, cover crops and living mulches, um, you can be improving your soil structure and fertility and reducing compaction um, and thereby Minimize, minimizing plant stress because um, that's usually helpful in preventing disease since a stressed plant is far less uh, resistant to diseases. So those were all soil-borne disease related. Um, cover, uh, sorry, companion planting can also help above the ground. Um, the same cover crop and living mulch uh, approach can help reduce splash up simply by keeping the soil covered. And this would correspond to a mechanical physical uh, IPM control, just because you could also just be using um, a, a non-living mulch, right? Um, and then in some cases, you might be able to limit some insect transmitted diseases um, by using some of the masking and visual confusion techniques that Kelly talked about, and generally by support, again, supporting your beneficials. So back to those biological controls. Um, and you can use living in mulch, living mulches and cover crops that help support those things too. Now let's look at what happens above ground. Um, one of the things that can improve or reduce disease pressure um, is to improve the air circulation pattern around your plants. So you may have often heard that preventing disease requires good airflow around your plants, but also what matters in addition to, to the quantity of airflow is the pattern in which the air is moving. And um, the example here is, is, suppose you have our favorite example again, a, um, a bed that has several tomato plants in it. And under normal conditions, if all you have in between them is a non-living mulch and so there's no other planting in between, you're gonna have the breeze flowing from one tomato plant to the next pretty directly. And that is a really efficient way for disease spores to be carried on that breeze from one plant over to the next one. And so that is um, a pretty, pretty common way for disease to be transferred um, amongst your plants. The idea here is that if you use, if you interplant with a different plant, um, various types of companion plants can be used in this manner. And if you use kind of this kind of interplanting, you can actually break up that airflow slow it down, uh, make it less linear, and some of those spores might not make it all the way over from one plant to the next. So two more benefits um, are pairing plants to provide support and also just to make it all look good. 
So first, um, companion plants can act as living trellises to provide support for climbing crops. And this companion planting benefit is related to IPM cultural and also mechanical physical controls. Uh, to use this pairing, you want to select for complementary growth habits. So pair an upright, sturdy, relatively tall plant with a vining one. And an example is to um, use corn as your tall, sturdy crop with beans, which would be uh, the vining crop. So you can let the beans then climb up the corn stalks. So this is actually two of the um, well-known three sisters planting method where the third companion is squash, which grows low along the ground, protecting the soil and preventing weeds. So some considerations for using plants to provide support are, um, you know, making sure that the supporting plant is strong enough not to fall over under the weight of the vining crop, and then planting your supporting crop um, earlier to give it a head start. And, you know, we don't always think about using edible plants when designing landscapes, but companion planting with crop plants can look as beautiful as, you know, any other garden design. You would apply, you know, the same design principles for any other uh, landscape design, where you can consider things like color palette, groupings of plants, repetition, textures, and or contrast. Um, this photo here shows Rosalind Creasy's beautiful you know, front yard edible garden with tons of flowers and herbs intermingled with the vegetables. Uh, so for inspiration, you can go check out her books for just stunning photos of food gardens. And we'll also get to see some really great examples um, in Shilpa's garden coming up. And last but not least, we can use companion planting for a very important benefit, which is to improve pollination. Um, so companion plants, um, companion plants support a wide variety of pollinators, um, including bees, butterflies, birds, beetles, and many more. Um, and all organisms need a balanced diet and a diversity of foods, and so if you're planting a pollinator garden, and actually many of our local um, demonstration gardens uh, have examples of this. I remember seeing a pollinator garden on a recent visit to Philoli, um, right in this area. And, um, and the idea with, with planting for pollinators is to make sure you have um, consistent food sources throughout the season. And how to do this, so a really great resource in when you're trying to figure out what to plant is pollinator.org. Um, and I believe that link is in the resources. And um, this is a way to get lists of pollinator plants according to our region. Um, surrounding Lingso, our local area is in the California coastal chaparral um, type of region. And so what you can do is you can target specific pollinators by planting the right plants. And you might even um, relate this to what it is you, whatever crop you're trying to, uh, to have well pollinated. So for example, here, uh, suppose you had a blueberry, a set of blueberries, and you wanted to make sure that you were uh, having great pollination for your plants. Um, and you find out that, well, a, one of the main pollinators of blueberries are bumblebees and you wanna support the bumblebee population. Um, and you can, you can then plant the right plants. In this case, one of them is crimson clover. Um, you can plant that near your blueberries to improve the pollination. The other thing, of course, that we mentioned already is to create habitat. Um, and one of the things that creates habitat that I just love is that often it's permission to be a lazy gardener, um, which I definitely count myself as. Um, and you know, even if you don't consider yourself a lazy gardener, anyone with a garden knows that there is never a shortage of garden jobs that you just never get to. And so if we can take some of those off our list and at the same time create habitat for beneficial insects, why not, right? So um, some of the things you can do are when you're cutting back your perennials after they flower, um, it's nice to leave it rather than cutting them all the way down to the ground because that might look tidier. Instead, try leaving six to eight inches of the hollow stems. It turns out that these are really great nesting sites for beneficial insects. 
Another one that many of you may have already heard is to leave your leaves. In fact, that is why they're called leaves, because you leave them <laughs> where they are. Um, and the idea is that these are, um, in addition to nourishing the soil beneath the tree that drops them, uh, these are also great, leaf, fallen leaves are a great uh, nesting site for caterpillars, and these caterpillars will then become uh, many of your pollinator species, right? So that is also a way to support, uh, to create habitat. Um, and then finally, um, don't forget about uh, ground nesting be bees. Many of our um, many of our native bees are ground nesting solitary bees. And what they rely on is um, patches of unmulched soil. So uh, this is counter to the advice that you should um, mulch every single inch of soil. <laughs> um, you should mulch most of your soil. Um, you don't wanna leave your soil uncovered for a variety of reasons, but a few patches, small patches of unmulched soil will really help support those ground nesting bees. Okay, so um, to sum up, we hope that um, it's clear that IPM and companion planting are different frameworks that lead you, you know, in the same direction, and that IPM and companion planting can work together to, to address um, a wide variety of issues to achieve a healthier garden with fewer challenges overall. Um, also plant a diverse mix of species. Uh, diversity of plants is fundamental for many of the reasons that we've gone over today. Um, intermingle your plantings, you know, mix things up, don't necessarily plant all the same species right in line with another. Learn how to use cover crops and living mulches, uh, your soil will thank you, and produce healthy plants. Uh, use naturally evolved relationships to work for you. You know, nature has been around for a really long time and we can learn a lot from it. <laughs> look for scientifically tested combinations. Um, these will be the most likely um, you know, strategies to work for you, but remember to experiment and then keep records. You know, it's really helpful to see what works for you and you, know, you can use those strategies over and over again. And you know, just a little reminder to always take some time to appreciate you know, the payoff that you're getting for all the time and energy that you're putting into your garden. And now, Shilpa will show you some examples of what we've covered today in her own garden. And let's start with this photo that we have right here. Um, I, this is a photo of, so one of the strategies I use in my own garden is to allow many of the, the edible crops that I'm growing, uh, especially herbs, um, many of them will flower and uh, it turns out that they are fantastic for beneficial insects. So I counted on this slide, whew, at least seven or eight bees on this mass of flowering garlic chives. So that's really fun. Um, it's, an, it's a reason to let these flowers persist until they form seeds and, um, and then I cut them back and let the, let the plant regenerate. Garlic chives are perennial, so they, they just keep coming back every year. Um, here are some examples of the way you can mix in herbs of different, you know, so, so what's fun about this is these are, these are tomatoes and then intermixed are several different varieties of basil. Um, you have purple, you have a variegated variety, you have a Greek, uh, mini basil. And then additionally, um, it's hard to see in the big picture on the left-hand side, but there are some cosmos in there. Cosmos are great for pollinators and beneficials um, generally. Um, here are more beds in my front garden. Um, some squash interplanted with, well, squash and cucumbers uh, interplanted with, again, cosmos. And then on the right-hand bed, we've got eggplant and basil and peppers um, mixed up with some sunflowers and marigolds. And I think there are some herbs in that bed too. Uh, here on this end, we've got melons on the other side of that same cosmos and um, the basils that you already saw in the tomato bed. Um, here's an example that I learned. So one of the things that happens is that as you grow these food crops and you have this bias towards 
um, experimenting, I had some leaks that went to flower and um, I don't think there are any shown on this in this picture, but um, the leaks, the flowers of the leaks, which are these big allium looking um, uh, balls um, that you see, they are just a favorite of, of bees. I, I would walk up to one of them and see a whole bunch of bees on one single flower. So that's really fun. Um, and so you can sort of, you know, if something just, if something ends up flowering, you can wait and see, okay, well, you know, is this doing something for my ecosystem? Is this, is this inviting a beneficial insect into the garden that I want to, to support? Um, here, um, artichoke, turns out artichoke flowers do the same thing way up at the top left side of this photo. You can see uh, some of my artichokes that I didn't manage to eat in time have turned into flowers. Uh, those are usually covered by bees. Um, this picture really demonstrates diversity. There is just a bunch of stuff mixed up in here. There's some, I believe there's um, some white yarrow. There's some California poppies. Um, some of the crops in here are shallots. Um, there are snapdragons, there's some fava beans, so just a big mix of stuff. Um, it's not done in neat rows or anything, and it really helps keep, keep things um, buzzing, as they say. Um, again, uh, just mixing in lots of flowers. Here the crop is onions, um, but it's hard to tell in amongst all of the other stuff, the poppies, the cosmos. There's some arugula that I, I at this point I always allow my arugula to go ahead and flower. Um, it turns out that the flowers are not only edible, but I think they actually taste even better than the leaves. So you can use them in your salads too. Um, on the left, we have sage that's flowering, um, a beautiful landscape plant, um, even, even though people think of it as a culinary plant, but if you do let it flower, it is gorgeous with the purple blue flowers. And then these days, um, more and more of my annual flowers, I just allow them to self-sow. So in this picture, you have masses of globe gilia and nasturtiums and poppies just kind of covering everything. And then once they're spent, I usually just allow them to self-seed again for the following season. Um, okay, this is uh, my neighbor's garden. Um, and this is an, a really good example of a mechanical physical control where they woke up one morning to find that raccoons had done this to their lawn. I am sure this is a familiar experience to many people. Um, it really is upsetting. <laughs> uh, what the raccoons are doing is pulling up the lawn to find um, gr the grubs that they that they like to eat under the surface of the of the lawn. Um, what they ended up doing is rolling those pieces back down. And this picture was just taken today, um, where we just put some spare hardware cloth over those rolled down. You know, we rolled everything back into place. Um, <laughs> you know, pressed it back down. It's rained a couple of times since then. And you can see the grass is recovering nicely and further damage is being prevented, at least for the short term with this hardware cloth and the pavers over it. Obviously this is an annoying solution for the long term, but in the short term, until we deter the raccoons, um, it can really work and it can rescue the damage to your lawn. Um, this is a great picture from our fellow master gardener, Karen Moore, who um, has, the finches uh, working on her behalf to do her own, do her pest management while she can just sit back and watch. Um, there are, I don't know, seven or eight finches on this, um, on this patch of Totsoy and they are just munching away on the pest insects. So really fun to see that. Okay, so we just kind of wanted to wrap up. Um our slides with a list of resources with more information that uh, you can refer to. We, you know, would love to encourage you to check out that first book on the list, Plant Partners by Jessica Walliser, because um, that really was uh, the inspiration for creating this workshop. And the next slide is, um, you know, some links to subscribe to our uh, Master Garden newsletter and also make a donation if you'd like to support us. Then if you have any questions, um, please submit them to the helpline and our fellow Master Gardeners will research and answer your questions. And 
Last but not least, we just want to thank Linkso Garden Materials and Can for hosting and supporting our presentation, and Karen Moore, who does a wonderful job of coordinating this speaker series, and we also thank her for that great photo of the finches and Tatsoi. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>